Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It's the 10th of April, 2022. As always, this is useful. Please go ahead and like and subscribe and hit the bell icon to get notified when I create new content. As always, the chapters are down at the bottom of the video and in the description, so you can quickly see, hey, what are the main updates this week? And you can jump to a specific one if there's one you're more interested than all of the others. But first, just something kind of cute, um, my dog. So Ollie was getting belly rubs last night and I just took these pictures that I thought were super, super cute. I don't know what that animation has just done, but he's all happy getting his belly rubbed. So I thought I would share that, don't know why. <laughs> New videos this week. I did a video all about confidential compute. There's various different steps of confidentiality and really integrity and security from things such as trusted launch through to VM level confidential computing through to enclaves. So I walked through all of those in this video. And then I did a video about the new dynamic capability of administrative units. So I can give an Azure AD role to a scoped set of objects instead of the entire Azure AD tenant. And now that administrative unit can have the membership based on rules around attributes of users or devices instead of having to manually add them to it. On to the new updates. So there's these new ARM64 based Azure virtual machines in preview. Before this time, we all have this x86 based virtual machines. Well, these are built on the Ampere Ultra ARM based processors up to three gigahertz. And why I might use this is many operating systems can run on ARM today, and generally I'll get a better price performance. These are cheaper processors. So there's gonna be these DP um, V5 versions with or without temporary disks that give you four gigabytes of memory per virtual CPU or up to that, up to 64 virtual CPUs, 40 gigabits per second networking, or there'll be memory intensive versions, the EPS V5, which will have up to 32 virtual CPUs, but those will give you eight gigabytes of memory per virtual CPU. So hey, I'm more memory intensive, the ratio of memory to CPU I need higher. Hey, we always go to those E-series virtual machines for that. Initially, it will have support for various Linux distributions like Ubuntu, CentOS, and Windows 11. There will be other operating systems coming down the line with things like Red Hat Enterprise Linux, uh, SUSE Linux Enterprise Server, Debian, Alma Linux, Flatcar, all on the way. Talking about confidential computing, so the DCSV3 is now in preview in Switzerland and, and Switzerland North and West US. So if you wanna start trying those out, you can see that in Switzerland North and West US. New VM SKUs have gone GA. So we talked about the memory intensive SKUs, the E series. For example, the EV5 is the latest. So what you'll now see is these EB, so EBSV5 and EBD SV5. The D means it has temporary local storage and cache, whereas without the D, it does not have that local temporary storage. And this is all about, hey, I need a bigger amount of storage, IOPS and throughput. So when I connect those managed disks, my virtual machine has a certain amount of IOPS and throughput. And that goes up as the VM gets bigger. But what about if I need a lot of IOPS and a lot of throughput, but I don't wanna make the VM bigger in terms of CPU and memory, I don't wanna pay for that. So now the whole big deal about these SKUs is they're very IOPS and throughput heavy. For example, I can go up to 120,000 IOPS and 4,000 megabytes per second of that connected managed disk storage with these. The reason these are really for the E series is think a lot of databases. A database needs a lot of memory in terms of RAM, but it also needs a lot of throughput and, and or IOPS. And so those go very well together. Hey, lots of data in memory, lots of data access through the disks. So these new EB series give me that much bigger ratio of storage IOPS and throughput to memory and CPU. So those are really gonna be powerful if I had those requirements. And the SKUs are available. So if we quickly go and look at the blog about those, just to give you an idea, 
it talks about, so this is the EB without the D. So you notice they're all kind of these uncached values, but we can see I go up to 64 virtual CPUs, but even below that at 48, hey, 120,000 IOPS and 4,000 megabytes per second. So we can get these much higher values. If I do the D, then it's the same as the above, but I also get temporary storage and I get a cached throughput as well. So obviously the cached throughput where I'm using the local storage of the host it's running on, when I use caching, I get higher values because I'm using that cache on the local disk. So those are available to me as well. Also, AKS capacity reservation support is in preview. I'm sure I talked about this in a previous video. Remember, capacity reservations let me start paying for a specific type of compute in a specific region availability zone via a capacity reservation group. And then when I'm ready to provision my service, I create it against that capacity reservation group, so I'm guaranteed that capacity will be there. Well, with this, my node pools can be configured to use a capacity reservation group. So when it's scaling, for example, or provisioning, I'm guaranteed to have that capacity there. But remember, from the time I create the capacity reservation group, I'm paying for that, whether a VM is using that capacity or not, but it guarantees it's there. On the networking side, so Azure IoT Central now has private link support. Remember, IoT Central is all about the idea of providing me a service for which my IoT devices can send their telemetry and for which I can do the management of those devices. Well, now what I can do is I can use private endpoints into my virtual network. So now those IoT devices, instead of talking to a public endpoint that lives on the internet, they can now talk to the private endpoints. Remember, a private endpoint is just an IP address within my virtual network. So if I have other networks could be on premises, providing they're connected to that virtual network, so they have an IP path to the private endpoint IP, could be a site site VPN, could be an express route private peering, well, they can use that. Now, the important thing to realize here is though, IoT Central uses quite a few different IP addresses, yes. There's the IoT Central URL, so there's gonna be a private link version of that DNS name to resolve. But then I have the IoT hubs, I then have the event hubs that correlate to the IoT hubs, there's a the device provisioning service. So it actually could use a lot of private endpoints because I can think it's up to 50 IoT hubs I could have um, in one of these services. This means I might use anywhere from 11 to 107 IPs for the private endpoints, depending on the size of my IoT Central instance. So just bear that in mind, but I can now use private connectivity uh, with my IoT Central. On the storage side, so Azure Backup now has metrics for Blob. And specifically this is talking about when I think of doing a restore job, for example. Now I have these restore health metrics. What that's gonna let me do is I can monitor the health of that restoration job. I could create alert rules based on that. And then if I can create alert rules, well, I can trigger action groups. Remember, action groups can call a whole set of different things. I can call a webhook, a logic app. Uh, I can do various types of notifications. All those different things I could do can now apply as part of a blob restoration process. Azure Storage Tables now have Azure AD role-based access control. There's a huge shift moving away from access keys and shared access signatures that are signed with the access key. We don't like those. It's better to be able to use role-based access control at the data plane. And a lot of the other Azure storage services have already done this. If, for example, we jump over to the portal super quickly, things like Blob, for example, um, already have done this. But if I go and look at just a storage account, which doesn't really matter which one, I'll just pick a storage account. If I go and look at the various roles that are available, we can see there's a whole set of these roles about data plane. So I can see, hey, look, storage blob data owner. There are ones around Azure files can integrate in with it. There are things about queues. Well, now what we also see is storage table 
data contributor and storage table data reader. So these have specific data plane permissions. If we actually look at the uh, permissions we have, if we look at data actions, we'll actually see, hey, it has read on the data plane level of those. So now I can start moving away from using access keys and shared access signatures, and instead I'm gonna use my Azure AD, which of course could be a managed identity if it's another Azure-based resource, could be a service principle, and you may even be able to get to that point in an ideal world where you can say, hey, I'm not gonna use an access key as at all. And once you've got to that point, you can actually go and, hey, disable the use. I could change this to disabled, and then I can't use the access key. Of course, that means I can't use shared access signatures either because, well, they're signed by the access key. But definitely that ability to now for tables as well to use RBAC, that's a great feature. Um, Azure Data Explorer now has private endpoint support as well. So I can use a private endpoint to connect to my Azure Data Explorer cluster. Miscellaneous. So Azure Bastion now has Kerberos support. So as part of that connections, I can now integrate my Bastion, providing my virtual network that it's deployed to is talking to my custom DNS. I can now use Kerberos for the authentication. As part of provisioning of an Azure Data Explorer cluster, I can actually execute inline scripts as well via the ARM template via my BICEP file. It doesn't have to be an ARM JSON, it can be BICEP as well. This is really useful is if I think about, well, maybe there's certain configurations that I want to do against the schema. Maybe I want to set up various schema entities like tables or functions before I would have to do that post deployment. Now I can actually trigger the script as part of the provisioning from my template to get that action to happen as part of the template deployment. So as part of, hey, I'm deploying the cluster, I'm also setting up various schema entities as well. There were a whole bunch of Windows 365 updates. Remember the point of Windows 365 is it gives me just this desktop as a service. I'm not even worried about things like Azure Virtual Desktop, where that's a managed service, but maybe I'm still thinking about, well, um, I have various pools, I have app publishing. Windows 365 is just, hey, a, a per user, you have a desktop. It's super simple to use. If I was to jump over super quickly and we looked, I have a Windows 365 desktop. And today, hey, I can go to this nice Windows 365 portal. I can see my nice little desktop. I can go and open it in my browser or I could have the MSTSC client, for example, and I can go and connect to it. And what this is giving me is a desktop hosted in the cloud. Now, I don't worry about anything. It's just there and here you can see I can do all these different things. I can access this from anywhere. So some of the announcements they've made of what's coming around this is firstly a Windows 365 application. So if I think about my local desktop, we have different desktops. I can jump between desktop sets of Windows, etc. Well now this Windows 365 Cloud PC will just show as if it's another desktop in my environment. So it's gonna be super easy to jump to it. And from the Cloud PC, I'd be able to jump back to my local desktop as well. There's also gonna be, um, so that was the Windows 365 switch. The Windows 365 app will actually just give me a nice easy access from the taskbar or the start menu to launch my Windows 365. There's gonna be a Windows 365 boot. So my local device, when it starts up, will actually then jump straight to my cloud PC. My experience will be, hey, I'll start my device up and then I'm logged into my Windows 365. They also talked about an offline mode. If I think about Windows 365 fundamentally as a VM somewhere, so there's a virtual hard disk containing the operating system, well, I'd have an offline ability to run that on my machine. Then when I was online again, I could sync it back up, any changes that were made to the state on the hard disk, and then carry on. There were also things about Azure AD join for Windows 365, better multimedia redirection, just a whole set of other things but lots and lots of investments there, lots of integration between, hey, Windows 11, Windows 365, Teams, and much, much more. Coming on, so Azure Backup Archive tier for VMs has gone GA. So this is the idea that, hey, my VMs in Azure, 
my VM-based workloads like SQL Server in an Azure IaaS VM, SAP HANA in an Azure IaaS virtual machine, they can have long-term retention. Well, now that long-term retention can be stored in the archive tier of Azure Backup, so that's much, much cheaper. Now, as part of that move to the archive tier, if it was an incremental backup, it converts to a full. That means it's bigger, but because archive is so much cheaper, it will still generally save you money. Now, as part of that, well, is it cheaper or not? There are recommendations in here. So it will recommend ones it says, hey, let's move these to the archive tier to give you a more cost-effective storage of those long-term retention backups. I can now have audit log for my Azure automation accounts have diagnostic settings. So if I think today my Azure automation account, I could have diagnostic settings, but the only things I would really be able to send to that was job status, job streams, not audit activity on the Azure automation account itself. Well, now I can, can. If I jump over super quickly back to this again, and I'll actually just close this down. Goodbye, my Windows 365. So if I was to go and look at an automation account, we have the regular diagnostic settings available to us. Well, what I can now also include as part of my diagnostic setting is yes, job logs, job streams, but also now audit events. And I get the same options I always do. I could send it to a log analytics workspace, a storage account, or event hub. So we're now, hey, if I'm interested in the activities happening on the automation account itself, well, I can go ahead and send that data to wherever I need it to go. So that's available. Um, Azure AD Graph is not retiring. Uh, end of June 2022, it has been pushed back. I don't think there's a new date yet. They've committed by the end of this year to give more detail on what the plan is now. But it doesn't mean you should stay on it. You should still be thinking about migrating off of Azure AD Graph and move to Microsoft Graph instead. That's really where all the investment is. That's the preferred endpoint and the API I want to use. And finally, Azure AD now has a device overview section that just gives me some nice, quick information about my device state within my tenant. So if I think about zero trust, devices and their state become far more important. So if I go and look at devices, we just have this overview preview page that just quickly shows us, hey, stale devices, non-compliant devices, unmanaged devices. I can see total number of devices, hey, preview features I might be using. And I can still then jump into things like the actual all devices to see details around um, registered, joined, using autopilot, my printers, if the printers are using universal print. So there's still a lot of extra detail, but just, hey, maybe go and check out that overview. Might give you some nice bits of information that you care about. Azure AD Identity Protection added some nice new detections as well from a, a security perspective. And that's it. So that's all the updates for this week. I hope that was useful as always. I know Wimpy's, this is a different Wimpy, but when I was in the UK, I used to love Wimpy burgers. I don't even know if it exists anymore. The last meal I had in the UK before I moved to America, I went to a Wimpy and had my cheeseburger and fries. Don't know why I told you that. Anyway, until next week, take care.